Hey everybody, my next guest is a comedian and actor who has been killing it on the comedy scene lately. He is a cast member and co-founder of the American High Sports with over a million TikTok subscribers already and views. And his first stand-up comedy hour special, Wolf Pup, is set to be released by 800 Pound Gorilla. Here he is, folks, Nick Callis. Nick, what's up, buddy? Hey! What's up, man? I'm uh, I'm good. What's going on, dude? Man, uh, exciting times for you, man. Wolf pup. This is uh, this is pretty awesome, man. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, it is exciting times. Um, it's it's exciting that it's exciting for anybody but me. That's cool. <laughs> How long was Wolf pup in the makings? It's a good question. So the the long answer is. 13 years ish right that's how long i've been doing stand-up um and the short answer is a little less than a year i don't it's hard to say because so i have put together hours before but i've never done an album and i've never done a this my first special my first album i did an ep um a few years ago which was it was just a it was a, sh a show that I um, recorded um, in an audio project for and just put out a, a number of tracks from it. But this is my first like proper seminal release. Um, and so the hour that ended up being the special started as an hour, 40 minutes of material that at the beginning of the tour I was doing, I went in with too much on purpose in hopes that I would whittle down and find what would be the best 55 hour, five minutes of material. Um, and I did, I found that. Um, but part of that was because there was the stuff that I was working on that felt like this is the very now stuff. This is the stuff I'm excited about. It's the stuff that feels pertinent right now to me. And then there's also, you know, just, tons of stuff that like you know how it is you find a joke that you're like ah this is really fun to do right now and i'm really enjoying doing this bit but it doesn't really belong any in a longer piece right, and then yeah. there was the stuff also that you're like i have this joke on the bench it crushes but it's kind of it's old to me it's not interesting to me anymore so i went in with like an hour 40 of stuff and that and i was touring for like six months before i recorded the special and then the six months before that, you know, I was on the road a little bit here and there. But when I when I chose the date to shoot the special, which was in Austin at the Creek in the Cave. Um, so six months before that is when I said, like, all right, blinders on. I'll write new stuff. But it, the focus is this stuff. So, you know, between less than a year is like really how long it took See, the, being a comedian is hard now you have to suppress all your funniest impulses it's like i want to guess your race i'm not gonna i'm not gonna do that but i want it when so this 800 pound gorilla um go to you and say hey like a year ago and say hey uh nick we we're we just didn't having you do this or is it you go to them or how does that part of it work out like how do you get um the, the backing of uh 800 pound gorilla good question um so at this point the first conversation i had with them was probably close to three years ago um and i was with a different manager i was with a company called authentic at the time so i think the way that it started was my manager at authentic had either met them at a festival or something and they said, like, who do you represent? What talent do you have? And I think he sent over, you know, a docket of like, these are the these are the people I rep. Um, and then I guess they checked out like a short list of comics and then asked if we could schedule a call just to like kind of general call, see what I was like working on and stuff. And actually at the time, this was right on the heels of the third and final screen test that I did for SNL because for like three years I was always doing stand up. I never stopped doing stand up, but I was probably too comfortable letting stand up take a back seat to writing and performing like sketch characters and impressions. Right. Yeah. 
And so I was like really aiming hard and everything I was doing was like singularly focused on trying to get on SNL. And uh, I got super close, but then it didn't happen. And I was so eager and excited to just run full force into stand up because there were so many jokes and I could feel them in my brain all the time that I either didn't write down or wrote down, but didn't perform or perform, but didn't post because I both knew and was instructed by like management and agents and stuff to keep a very um, safe isn't the right word, but that's part of it. You didn't want a Shane Gillis type of thing. Well, happening. There's, there's that, but even beyond like the whole like edginess or like cancelability factor, there's also just this thing of like, they liked me because I could do a lot of impressions and they liked that I was a stand up. Um, but that they didn't care about it for me. They liked the characters and impressions I did. So my team was very focused on them maintaining that perspective of me, which honestly is silly because it's not like there was a guy there watching my Instagram every day. But it was <laughs> it was a mental thing too. Like making a joke like that helps you sort of keep your eye on the ball and um yeah, because, dude, yeah. like, you know, if you look at it the way the times are, if you do, po like, even something you did, you know, if you if you start to really become household name, they're going to look into you, into all of your stuff. You know what I'm saying? Like, so yeah, you, you, it is smart to be safe, uh, you know, and, and but I, I do think there's maybe a, some kind of, um, that, you know, rebound happening. I think the, the pendulum swinging, you know, into the middle, so to speak, not so crazy woke i mean i know manhattan might be uh, still there <laughs> but well, you, know. you know it's interesting because there's a couple things i think i think um you know with the example of shane gillis he just hosted snl yeah. so it's not there isn't some actual objectivity towards like what's good or what can be said or who can say what or what's allowed it's all the temperature of the moment and at the time the temperature was that shane can't um but then it and then also you know his fame is obviously a huge factor in the fact that he could just kind of waltz right back on and host the show so but i think like you know bearing that in mind uh it's all very flex and it's all very f the feeling of the moment um because personally like you know, there are times where I'm like, oh, this joke's a little bit, this one's a little dangerous. And then maybe it doesn't feel that way a day. Like, there's just such a zeitgeist and, like, collective consciousness around sensibility that, I don't know, things are really not so cut and dry. And even, like, being in New York, I think people, like, have the pretty fair assumption that it's, like, very... um progressive which weirdly equates to very sensitive as far as audiences but by the same token because you have these like you know in some cases kind of like elitist high-minded people they're also kind of the best comedy audiences because they're aware of what comedy is so like i you can't you can't, everything you say is a generalization you know what i mean right like about audiences it's all made up bullshit it's what you choose to believe if you get on stage and you believe like these people know me and they love me and they're here to see me do whatever I want to do. Then like your set will reflect that. Like I'm a big proponent of the idea that really you decide. Right. Yeah. Like a lot of comics say that, you know, that they, they you can't blame the audience. There is no good audience, bad audience. It all starts and ends with you and how you vibe and just, you know, no, read the room and all that sort of thing, but you could even win them over, you know, like you, you, yeah, you could win them to, to, you know, uh, uh, to be on your side and, and once they're with you you could pretty much go anywhere with them yeah don i had a set at a at stand-up new york over the weekend um like you know prime eight o'clock saturday audience and uh they were they were cold like you could just see like the host who's um who's laura soger who's hosting the show she's amazing she's so funny uh and she did everything a hundred percent correct they just were a crowd that like didn't feel like a crowd yet it's a new club they're eating fucking chicken parmesan it's like not yeah. 
you know what I mean? It's it's the it's Broadway. Like we're in Midtown. People just saw the Harry Potter musical or whatever. Like it's not <laughs> comedy, really. Um, that being said, like you could feel like oh, they need to be cracked, and uh, you know, on a, on a good night, that's kind of my that's kind of the energy I want to go out to because it forces me to bring a thing that is actually more interesting to see contextualized by people feeling sort of not in the comedy energy. So, uh, you know, like I, I did just that and it was what worked and what was right for that room. But it was th- me having the set that I had is dependent on thinking that they aren't ready for this and that i'm gonna you know what i mean because sometimes right. like so you, you go out guns blazing in that case more yeah, energy yeah. like really uh, turn it up exactly. a notch. yeah exactly but also you can do that you can do that not knowing you're doing it or you cannot do that or you can do that and it have completely varying like there's no it's just keys and you just gotta try every single one and the more comedy you do the the more accurately you pick the key from your set of more keys that you have. Some of you guys might have girlfriends. Did you guys know that they shed? <laughs> <laughs> they just leave hair. Fucking <laughs> like we could never murder someone. What are you doing? <laughs> just DNA everywhere. <laughs> just evidence. <laughs> In the shower, she'll leave. Uh, yeah, you know. You know what it is. No, wait, what is it? Say it out loud. Scream it. Twirls. What the fuck is wrong with you? Hey, that's not a normal thing to do. Human beings don't do that at all. You should go to jail. It's so we don't clog the drain. So instead, I'll just paint a mural of my scalp on the wall. What? No one does that. Dude, a fucking... Spiral like she's trying to summon a hair demon. Like, what the fuck is that, dude? The stuff I've seen of you on TikTok, you definitely have the energy. You know, you you, you got the jokes, you you, you know all that, but you also kind of you know body language moving around, um, and and all that. You kind of take in the whole stage. Thanks, man. Yeah, it's uh, it's both by design and also just kind of who I am. Um. Like, if you know me personally, you know, like, you say anything that activates me, like, even slightly emotionally, then, like, I'm going to be flailing around at some point. It's just, like, <laughs> my family is, like, Greek, and I come from a household that's all boys and a single mom. Like, if you have a point to make, like, you got to make that. Uh, <laughs> but then also, like, I really just, from the, you know, creative side of it, like, artistically, like, I... I love that stand-up comedy like actually doesn't have rules. And I think it's extremely underutilized that element of it, which is that you can, if you want, like your elbow is the joke. Like there's nothing like the, the only real goal is these people have to laugh. And there's an infinite amount of ways to do that. Truly. I think most people, especially like New York comics have decided the way to do that is by a series of like ostensibly, topical edgy one-liners but like that to me i mean i respect it and it's cool and you know i I try to have a, a balanced menu but like that to me is boring and i'd rather i'd rather the the humor feel uh to the audience like they were kind of instrumental in it and i think the more the more that i articulate whatever it is i'm doing with my body the more they see and feel involved in that I'm like very present. Yeah. Cause that's the thing. It's in a live art form. So people have to feel that you're present. Cause you know, if, if you're, if you're just up there saying jokes into a microphone with like extremely predictable timing, we almost don't need you to be there. It could be a record player. And I want to surprise myself. I'm also not at my best if I'm not surprising myself. Like I was saying this, to someone the other day that like I have to there has to be some degree of my set that's like improvised or at the very least like very open and spontaneous otherwise I'm not having fun and I will bomb if I'm not having fun I have right. to enjoy myself yeah I think so and and I think that you, you embody that when you're on, on there and um 
I do love what you said about there's no rules to making people laugh. I think there's a lot to be said inside of that because you do get a lot of these kind of like um, these kind of comics that, you know, um, will say, oh, it's a guitar comic. Oh, here's a ventriloquist. Oh, here comes, a, you know, mm -hmm. a, a prop comic, you know. But hey, to your point, there's a million different ways. to. The goal is to make the audience laugh. So totally. as long as I'm achieving that goal, then what's the problem? Like, does it Seriously. all have to be this epic, you know, this stoic kind of, um, you know, for lack of a better way to say it, without insulting the other styles? Is Does it all have to be this clever, you know, kind of stuff? Or can you, you be slapstick yeah. or, or have fun? Yeah. And I mean, I think there's like a bit of a epidemic of joke tellers, which it look, it's certainly one way to do it. And it's actually... It's the primary way to do it. Um, but because it is, uh, I think a couple things happen. You get most people doing that. And then you also get most of comedy looking a certain way, which for an audience, for, you know, people who are paying attention to comedy gives them the impression that that's what comedy is. Right. But I think that's because it's, there's the lowest barrier to entry um for comedy styles for that which is just you write a joke the shorter the better it's actually like a very difficult thing to do incredibly well but the people doing it don't know what the difference between doing it incredibly well and doing it is so what happens is you have five guys who are amazing at it because they do know the difference because they've been doing it forever and they pay attention to great guys and they're intrinsically funny and then you have a lot of you know day jobbers who are also just doing that because you um talent hides really well within that style it's very difficult to discern where someone's talent is if what they do is they write a series of one-liners the only thing that can sort of express whether or not they're great is those one-liners themselves and also that becomes subject subjective and like it's just it just gets really muddied yeah, um yeah. and they say there's like, there's like there's the comedian uh, and and then there's a comic, and yeah. this, you know, and the the co comedian, um, I forget which is which, but the comedian says funny things, and the comic says things funny. Right. Yeah, I think it's the flip. I think it's a uh, comic says funny things, and comedian says things funny. The, right. Which you know, like that's kind of a nice encapsulation of like what it is. But again, like. I don't I think that just like underutilizes the instrument of the comedian or the comic, like whatever you want to call it. I also think like, you know, if you ask any of your friends, what's the funniest story of your life? Um, picturing what it is they're talking about is the is the funny, funniest thing. It's not hearing the way they they construct uh a, a four sentence organization of that story and i think that's because i think that's why comics the great comics are so good is because they can like really laser focus comedy at you but again it's one way it's one way um and i think those guys can do that really well and in some cases can't do other stuff but i think people who can't do either of those things just choose that because you don't need to have the confidence to pretend to be a swordfish and lay on your back and nobody like I'll tell you what bombing in my style that <laughs> shit hurts different Don that is like because you're putting it all out there you're really yeah dude but it makes you better because it gives you the confidence to really you know ten toes on what you're trying to express which you know it helps you find humor within that. It helps you like sort of radar what it is people are going to connect with because you need to have that thing that they're really going to resonate with. Whereas like if you do a, you know, you do like a dead baby joke one liner, ah, you told a joke and everybody goes, ah, we didn't like that one. But <laughs> you know, 13 seconds later, you got another one. Whereas you, I've, I've, I've had to get up off the ground in silence. <laughs> that does not feel good, dude. When you can hear your clothes, Rub against each other. <laughs> so what is, you do like a like a, a dead baby joke and you're actually flopping around the on the uh, stage 
That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, hilarious. yeah, yeah. So, but I get bet when it hits, you got him roaring. What's wrong with, let me hold the baby. Why can't I hold the baby? And she goes, because you know you're just you're always joking around. I'm a fucking comedian. <laughs> As if I'm gonna be like, can I, I can hold the baby? Oh my God, thank you so much. Oh, by the way, guys, have you guys ever heard the one about the baby and the ground? <laughs> Why? It's a joke. <laughs> Light it up, get a sense of humor. <laughs> Come on. You can make another one. It's a baby. Totally. I mean, you know, anybody will tell you like, comic or otherwise, maybe even especially comics that like, that stuff, physical comedy, um, you know, impressions, a lot of stuff that people call hack, it, they call hack because it's it can level a room. Yeah. Um, but there's a there is an original way to do all of that stuff. And so I think the challenge for guys who are, quote unquote, performers or like talent show comics is finding a way to be original and unique uh through that because that can also be a crutch just being funny can also be a crutch you know audiences can go home with nothing to think about if right. you just around and you just dance around and you just do eddie murphy voice or whatever it is like you know it's a double-edged sword it's like the best comics are both um or at the very least like aware of the value of the other styles i i believe that too both being comedian and comic i i, I believe that too and and I think that that's what you know the ones that rise to the top are the full package deals, mm -hmm. and um, and I do think there's something to being um, more of an entertainer um, in this day and age. Like you said, there's so many comics, there's so many comedians up there, um, kind of all doing the same thing. You know, that's their take on you know David. There's a million David tells right <laughs> or whatever. But if everybody's doing, if everybody's if everybody's going this direction it's good to have people going that direction because it's yeah. refreshing and, and as an audience member it's refreshing and they're going to remember you they'll be like even if they don't necessarily remember your name right away they'll be like oh that guy that was mm -hmm. jumping around and uh you know he's hilarious he had all these crazy stories he's talking about the dead baby flopping on the ground <laughs> that guy was awesome so so yeah people remember you and and that's kind of like when i see your tiktok and the instagram blowing up like this it's because you have that and uh and and that's like the first time that i saw you i was going through their instagram i saw you and i even commented on it because you had the the uh the black wife beater on and i was like hey look like they look like dan cook or whatever and you laughed at it but uh <laughs> i wish that police would treat unarmed black dudes the way i treat trans people every single time i meet mean, a trans person i'm like okay let's all relax nobody <laughs> wants to lose their job <laughs> <laughs> So I'll just take it real slow here. Nobody reach for anything. This is simply a case of mistaken identity. You see, I thought you were some guy. I first of all, I love that um, that that's like what resonates because it's also like it's not a short. It hasn't been for me. Uh, a, a short path to forget success just like being a working comic and paying my bills like it's you know there it's a high risk high reward style um and i call it a style but i don't it, to me it's not a it's not a choice that's me that's who you are right yeah um but it is a you know there's just like a different risk factor when the thing that you're doing has like a different um different value add different like reliability even like as far as how i feel about myself as a comic like it took me a long time to become consistent um and really even understand like what it is that i'm doing and how to do it um but yeah man and then like as far as like i mean you look like dane cook right like like you said he's uh he was a guy that was like one of the first guys to do what he does in with such a big splash that it sort of added a wing to comedy. It was like, now this is okay. Right. And granted, yeah. if it had added a bigger wing or really expanded people's 
understanding of what stand-up could be, it would mean two things. It would mean that he's actually a, it would have done less for him because it would m- mean inherently that what he did was not so new and refreshing. Um, but then it would also make it so that he's not the thing that people who do similar things are compared to. Two and a half hours into a game of Monopoly. Here it is, ready? I quit! <laughs> it's four in the morning, Grandma, you win! I'm sitting on Baltic with crap! Don't touch me, Grandpa, she's cheating! I hate when you're the banker, Grandma, where did you get the pink 50s? Right. Um, I'm actually wearing a black tank top, which is what he wears in his Comedy Central Presents, which I think is why, like, a hundred thousand people commented that on that video. <laughs> did, was um, that a deliberate move, or did you just? Oh shit! I'm no, wearing... I literally wear tank tops on stage. That's a freaking awesome, man. Thirty percent of the time, but it's it, it kind of is a similar thing to the way that I perform, which is that like I just want to be me, and sometimes you have to force yourself to be authentically you by way of doing the things that are comforting for you but on stage. So it's, I wear tank tops or am shirtless just whenever possible because I'm just comfortable (laughs) comfortable at home in a tank top. I'm a comedian. I'm not in an office. If I'm working on my laptop all day, I'm wearing a tank top or nothing. So (laughs) at some point I, and then also it was like the summer in LA. I was living in LA. I was just like, I'm wearing tank tops on stage. I don't care. And I don't want to dress up and make myself feel not like me up there because that brings me further from me. Right. And I actually know that that me is beyond the material. My most reliable attribute more often than not, especially now, the way that I perform is I go up and I talk because I remember knowing about, Richard Pryor that he would just go up and talk. And I'm like, oh, so that's possible. If I go meet my friends for lunch at someone, I'm just going to talk and I'll make them laugh. So I need to be able to do that on stage in the highest of um, circumstance. Like I need to be able to do that at the comedy cellar. And I need to be. And that's when I really started to do well is to just trust myself. And like within that trust, be daring and just fucking go for it. Yeah. And then, you know, like, Growth co- and that just kind of is like holistic for me. What I'm wearing, what I talk about, all that is holistic. Go to Jersey and see like two Italian dudes outside of the deli just using their whole body. Fuck, <laughs> well, they yeah. me go. They're like trying to dodge each other's arguments. You got your fucking mind, bro. What the fuck are you talking about? Are you fucking kidding me, dude? There's no fucking chance. No, not a fucking chance. <laughs> Were you influenced by Dane Cook at all, or, or uh, do you? you know, oh, yeah. I think he was a juggernaut. Uh, I love Dane Cook. I got to, I interviewed him back in the day, just before he he really exploded. I've seen him a few times in stadiums. Um, I, I feel like guys like like that sometimes, um, if you skyrocket too fast or hit a certain market too too soon or whatever, I think you know that's what could happen. With in Dane's case, he kind of shot up and then you know, just came down hard. But I, I think he's a great comedian and anybody like, um, and, you know, it, people who hated him in those days hate him because he was so good. And um, I think he so. just kill. Yeah. So what's your thoughts so. on? Yeah. I've, I've always loved Dane, man. I, uh, he was one of my, I mean, my all time favorite entertainer, artist, comedian, whatever is Jim Carrey. That's who I idolized. From, oh, yeah. yeah. You know, the first time I saw a movie Um, and then uh, and then Eddie Murphy and Mike Myers, you know, anybody I was watching on like VHS as a kid, right. even outside of stand up. Um, but, st- but I remember seeing Jim Carrey stand up very young. Um, But then when I was 11, 12, whatever age it was, and like Dane Cook MP3s were making a splash. Yeah. Um, I had heard Dane before I'd ever seen Dane. I had uh, my brother had an iPod um, and I would like take it when he was at like football practice or whatever. And I just like walk around with it. And he had like one or two of the albums that Dane and I would just 
memorize that guy's stuff and i would do the bits to my friends and stuff um the and burger then king he is the burger king all those bits and that... the pickles yeah the pickles <laughs> Yeah. Hi, ma'am. May I please take your order? What do you want? What do you want? I said, I said, butt seeds, no butt seeds. What do you want? But no, 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 no. Yes, no. Cheese. Extra pickles. Uh, and then I saw his presents, which, you know, like made a huge impression on me. Um, Probably one of the best presents ever, I think. It's definitely top it's, 10. It's the yeah. best Comedy Central presents, I think. Yeah, and, I would say it's definitely up there. But yeah, so I always love that dude's stuff. And then, and then, uh, you know, like he, he, that's the other thing about comedians, man. It's like, they're not movie studios. Like our releases, our specials, our whatever it is, our shows, they are this thing that we work really hard on, then it goes out. But you can't expect, you never hear a story about how um, Paramount Studios parents died. Like things right, happen right. in comedians' lives and comedians are not bigger than the brand. So, you know, stuff takes you another way and like life happens. And that, I mean, like Carlin, right? Like Carlin went through so much that really shaped his comedy in his like later years too. And he's brilliant all the way through, but it definitely changes the accessibility for people i think some version of that happened to dane i think he also was like in such a rare position to be the like face of stand-up comedy and then once you know he's you also you're basically a pop star uh so that makes him cool to hate or whatever right i don't know i never i never gave a crap about any of that stuff i just like i come to everything that i come to creatively by way of having been a comic book reader who wanted to draw comic books so i've always been lucky in that i've always seen stand-up as art and only really cared about the product um and so yeah eventually i'd spoken to dean a couple times just through like tiktok and stuff uh he's always been you know kind in my very limited interactions with them so i don't have a reason to hate him Uh, oh that's awesome i i i think uh yeah I was, I was hoping that you had met him or something like that. That that would be super cool. Yeah, but, I would um, love to get the opportunity to like be on a show with him and really talk to him about comedy. Um, but we'll see one day, maybe. Yeah, man. Yeah, and, and you mentioned Jim Carrey and, and those early Jim Carreys too, with the impressions and his face contortions and all that stuff, mm-hmm. man. Like uh, I could see that influencing you too as an impressionist and as a, you know wanting to do sketches and all that stuff. Clint Eastwood. Yeah, I mean, for my money, he's the best at comedy. And I think, like, I think, like, what he does best, nobody does as good as him. And I think what other people do best, they probably don't do as well as what he does best. Like, I think he's one of those Michael Jordans in that, like, he's born and you're like, well, of course this guy would find stand-up. And of course... He had to, because what the fuck? Imagine going to Baskin Robbins and your guy making your ice cream is Jim Carrey. And you don't <laughs> have any context for who Jim Carrey is, but you're just like the weirdest guy, the funniest guy alive. Gave me a chocolate scoop ice cream today. Like either he <laughs> had a Clint Eastwood face. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's a great point, man. It, it's uh, a lot of th- those type of things that you know, like they say, like. You know, comedy finds you. You don't find it. It like, you mm-hmm. know, when you have like for yourself, when you have all these skill sets, when you're a funny guy, you're an artist, you you got all these um, talents that th- it finds you. You know, like there's you know, like um, if, you know, to, in, even in your case, of course, you're going to be making your way through stand up comedy and being up there because you know that's where you belong. 
Yeah, man. I appreciate that. But I think it's also like, you know, to some degree, all these things are like a matter of just living a blessed life and having that opportunity available to you. But I also think it does take a large willingness because I think a lot of people like I I talk to people after my shows all the time. Like, what do you do? What do you want to do? Which are like often different answers. Um, almost yeah. every time is a different answer. Right. Uh, but I like had a strong feeling about what I wanted to do, which was a lot of things, but I knew it was creative. And I just like refused to accept any other life for myself, which, you know, uh, I'm 31 now. Like as soon as I was out of college, all my friends, um, at least like the kids that I went to school with, you know, had like hundred thousand dollar careers, like fresh out of college. And like, we're like working at banks and stuff like that. And I was like waiting tables or dropping, you know, people's food off and stuff like that. And you feel the difference. Did you ever but... see, um, did you ever see that Seinfeld comedian documentary where he's talking to Orny Adams? Yeah. And, and it's a very yeah. similar, very similar conversation where he's, he, where Seinfeld's like, so what? Let them have that. That's boring. Their lives are boring. <laughs> Do you ever stop and compare your life and go, okay, I'm 29. My friends are all married. They're all having kids. They all have houses. They, they have some sort of sense of normality. I, 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 I agree, but then what do you tell your parents? What do you, you know, how do you deal with that? They're so you tell your parents. Yes. You know, like, how do you, this is your, <laughs> your parents. <laughs> That's the thing. Like, you know, I never really understood. I understand the, the fever panic that you can have just about life and security and shit like that. But I don't, I don't have this sensation that I'm missing anything. And I think it's because the things that I chose to put in my life, I chose and are more important to me. To me. Like I, I like living in New York city. I like living in an apartment. Um, but I also don't give a shit because I, I think that if one day I'm going to have a nice big house and, kids and cars and whatever whatever you could want um those like are blessings and to me those are the cherry on top the reward for doing the thing i told myself that i was going to do because i want to do it so yeah i don't i don't fucking care dude i just want to like make movies and tell jokes and make music and draw comics and just like that that's my gift to myself is the stuff that i make Boys, you're cleaning out the shed today, and Nick, you're adopted. Let's fucking go, dude. I want to get this over with. I'm not helping you clean the shed. Did she say I'm adopted? Dude, get up right now. We got to clean this shed and get it over with so I can shampoo my bicycle. She, she said I'm adopted. She, she, she just said I'm adopted. Dude, get up. My parents could be anyone. You're helping me. My parents could be anybody. Will Smith could be my dad. I fucking hate you. Will Smith is my dad. Will Smith is my dad. <laughs> Will Smith is my- Boys, can you clean out the shed today, please? And Nick, you're my biological son. Fuck you. I think everybody has their own journey and I think uh, creatives, anybody who's a creative understands exactly what you're talking about. And, um, you know, anybody's a comedian, especially, but, you know, I think when you go on a creative path, there are certain kind of sacrifices or things you put to the side because you got to focus on the goal at hand. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think you're doing everything right. You got a, you know, a, 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 your first full length kind of record coming out. That's going to come out on, on YouTube and, and, uh, audio, um, and you and you you you're making big strides in the scene right now. Do, are Thanks. you like when you get uh, you know, if in thirteen years you've been doing this now, what, well, what's the the vibe like in the in, amongst the other comics? Like uh, you know, because the city guys uh, could be a rough bunch. Uh, you know, like uh, the comedy seller crew and all those types. How do you fit in amongst those guys? Yeah. Um, well, so I have a I have a really good group of immediate peers um there's you know five or six guys that i've always considered like my true and closest 
contemporaries because comedy has so many sort of generations and sub generations because there's guys who are probably not much older than me but they're they started two years before so that's a lifetime in comedy right. but there's a couple guys that started pretty much at the exact same time as i did i mean me and a comic named andre d thompson uh started like you know within we were at each other's first ever show i think so oh, within nice. weeks of each other um and he's doing excellently and you know nico white is a guy who's also my age and yeah, eagle wit guys like that um uh -huh. brendan sagalow these are all dudes who for my year my graduating class like these are the guys that are like leaders of the pack and we're all like thick as thieves you know what i mean like those are my best friends yeah um and as far as how i feel about myself i always feel great about what i'm doing but if and when i bump into these guys and even it's just like oh dude that new thing is great or like great set or whatever or i saw that video i mean that's the stuff that makes you feel like yeah it's uh i have yeah you know it's like a thing that like eminem would rap about but like having the respect the respect of your peers um is the number one thing and i think like I've been doing good work for long enough and have been, you know, at it 13 years. And more often than not, if I go somewhere, obviously all the comedians know who you are, but, you know, some staff knows who you are and, uh, you know, bookers you haven't met know who you are and people just that come to the shows know who you are. And even if it's small numbers, it means a lot because it's really, you know, it's one thing that, uh, our performance evaporates behind us as we walk into the next show. So all you can really take with you is the feeling you have about yourself. Um, so when the work that you've done that's behind you starts to appear in front of you by way of just overload, then you start to really reap the benefits of your time spent because you go into a room and, you know, some young kid who does open mics and stacks chairs at the club goes like, Hey, Dude, I saw your thing that da, da, da. one time I was in the back of Gotham Comedy Club and I saw and like that's fucking it feels amazing, dude. Like it feels amazing. Like any any job that if you walk in and somebody who is where you were at one point validates you and you know that in a way you're them because you were at some point and you do what you do because at some point you felt how they do now, like it's the greatest full circle thing in the world. Yeah, it doesn't get much better than that when you could inspire people that were where you were once, um, you know, and just keep climbing that mountain, man. The school is on fire. So form a single file line and slowly enter the hall. Come pick me up. Leave something. all possessions for some reason. I told my mom I hated her this morning. No talking for some reason. No running for some reason. We will now stand on the front lawn and watch as the school burns to the ground. Hey, make sure you are standing on the only flammable substance here. Perfect. All right, I'm going to read off your names and make sure that everyone is here now that it's over. Even though this is a life or death situation, let's make sure we all just chill and wait till the fire truck arrives instead of leaving. Perfect. With the sketch stuff, when you um, were auditioning for snl did you ever get a chance to audition in front of lauren yeah yeah uh a few times um 20 i think it was 2020 2021 and 2022 or 21 through 23 something like that but those those three years yeah so and i opened for colin jost uh a few times um who's a really nice guy so so do you still feel like it's a possibility to get it to get in or is it like how do you weigh uh, that out i don't now? think i don't think it's impossible i think it's highly unlikely because one they've seen me and at this point they've kind of seen not to say that i couldn't surprise them or that they understand all that i am creatively but i think like they're casting a television show you know, like their job is to cast a television show with a group of actors who are characters in and of themselves that is going to be like digested by 
these like mass audiences. And so it's never a matter of like, are you good enough to get like if you audition for that show, you're fucking talented. Like that's if you get to Lauren Michaels, with, yeah, yeah, you definitely dude, like, got the goods, bro. Yeah, there's nobody that's accidentally maybe a couple here or there or whatever, but there isn't really anybody that's like screen testing for SNL that's like accidentally there. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> yeah. these are like really talented people. Um which, you know, this is something I had to like really internalize at some point because it's impossible not to take everything in life personally, let alone like a Saturday Night Live audition. But um, yeah, I think I I think it's definitely not my path any longer. And like I'm actually I don't think I ever would have said this in the first few months after like not getting the show. But I like that because I never wanted to be on SNL. You're so eager to make it in whatever way might present itself when it starts. And I still am in a lot of ways, but I'm just more particular about like what is actually worth my time and what I'm interested in doing. And also like, here's the thing, like I started when I was 17. So that kind of gives you 10 years to fucking do whatever to try to make it. But, you know, I'm 31 now and I don't. I, let's say I die when I'm 60. That gives me like less than 30 years to do the stuff that like I was put on the planet to do. And that might be making like a movie like Inception. You know what I mean? That might be making an album like Purple Rain. That might be making a stand up as well. Like it, so I don't know. I just don't feel like what I make available to myself creatively can be dictated by like somebody else. like I used to work in diners and restaurants and I'd be polishing silverware for a uh, Salbanian dude who opened an Italian restaurant. And the whole time I'm doing it, I'm just thinking like, Oh, I'm just a, I'm just a piece of this guy's dream. Right. You know what I, mean? <laughs> you, I have my own dreams. Right, right. I, I want my own Italian restaurant. So yeah, I don't think I'll ever be on that show. Maybe I'll be extremely lucky to get to host it at some point, but also like, I don't know, look at Tim Robinson, man. Like I think that guy's sketch show is infinitely better than Saturday Night Live for my taste. So I would kind of much rather just do that. Like I'd rather make my own shit. (laughs) What's it like when you, when you go, you know, like the third time and there's Lauren, how are you feeling? What's the vibe like? And, and what, what, how do you decide what set, what characters, all that kind of stuff? Because this is your third yeah. time, so they've seen a lot of your stuff. I think in retrospect, I would have just tried to not strategize. I think I strategized so much because I'm someone who I'm like, I over prepare, um, even if what that means is not preparing and just being spontaneous and loose. But I put a lot of thought into And for me, an opportunity that big meant that I had to take it upon myself to do every single thing possible in order to better my chances. Like that's what I felt my obligation was, was to come correct. Right. Like it, it will not be, I will not make it easy for them to say no. Um, so, you know, I thought, I went through every joke I ever told, every character, every line for every kid. Like I really, put the thought into, but that's what I needed to do to get to where I got. Somebody else might have chosen the sort of theory of the week that is like, yeah, you just got to roll up now, give a shit and try to be no funny. And like, that could be it. I, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I remember feeling like extremely calculated about everything I did and said and, who I, you know, who I spoke to at the show and all these things, um, which I think served me at the time. It uh, it also feel like actually showing up to the studio and all that feels like meeting your new girlfriend's parents, right? It's like, you don't want to like, you know, it's so funny. It's like, it's weird, but like, if it's not SNL, it could be anything. It could be meeting your girlfriend's parents. It's, crazy how the little moments in between moments get affected like someone's like hey just follow us this way and then you're like fuck do i like how big a step do i take you know what i mean like 
<laughs> right? You know what? It's like all this weird little shit. And you're like, if I go to the bathroom now, are they going to think it's because I'm nervous? And so I had to pee. But if I wait to do it later, are they going to think that I was purposely wait? Like, you just, you're <laughs> not a fun fucking place to be, dude. You're just <laughs> questioning if you should urinate. Like, it's, no, I don't want, there's nothing. Because the stakes were high, kind of. You know, yeah, you're thinking, you know. Because so here's the thing. And they're also kind of like, I mean, dude, the whole thing is like, you are, you're being asked to nonchalantly approach a five minute set of material as if it will not snap your fingers, change your life forever. Like, it's like, it's like if someone was like, hey, we're going to ask you a series of questions. And depending on whether or not we like your answers, we might add you to Mount Rushmore. And you're just supposed <laughs> to be like, oh, it's <laughs> fucking insane. It they give you a contract to sign. And then, and so if you, you signed it. So you're on the show as far as you're concerned. Right, and then right. they get to go. Mm -hmm. And then if they like it then you're on the show like it's just such a fucked up way of doing something dude um but i get why they do it that way i wouldn't do it that way if i was casting a show but you know whatever it's it's cool that there's like a comedy institution it's cool that like six people a year sometimes one sometimes there have been times where it's zero get to like maybe join the NBA All-Stars and you could be fucking 18. Like it's right, cool. Right. It's cool that that exists cuz it probably won't uh, ever again. How do they let you know if you if they're, you know, hiring you or not? Like do you get a phone call, is it an email, does Lauren call yeah. you? Like what goes on you with could, that? You could if you get it it could happen a lot of different ways. One of the writers could call you, Jost could call you, you could get called directly by Lauren. Um if you don't get it it usually takes a you either find out a couple days before everyone who did or, you know, the even sadder way a couple days after either by way of osmosis or just your agent will go, hey, they right, yeah. or whatever. And when you get that, um, how like how you handle that? Did it put you put you out or did you say, all right, you know what, I, I'm moving on. I didn't want this like, you know, all the things you point you made earlier where, you know, what, I'm going to do all these other things anyway. Or how do you like? Does he go through yeah. any depression, or what happens? I think the bulk of my emotional response to all of it, getting the chance, not getting it, kind of took place over the course of like the three years that it was my focus. But the first time not getting it, that super hurt. But also, I felt that it was so far, so I think I was prepared. The second time not getting it. I felt closer. Um, so I think that was the one that really was a gut punch. Uh, and then the third time I was like, I don't, I don't expect anything. I don't care. And it was pretty easy to just walk through after that. Um, but I think also like, you know, it's like anything, it's like exposure to the elements that creates a sense of comfort. And like, it's kind of that way with anything like doing stand up for the first time is more nerve wracking than auditioning for SNL. And your body doesn't understand context and imagination and television. Your body just goes like, oh, we're nervous for some reason. <laughs> so how are we going to handle this? So, you know, if you if you could have like some mindless organism pick between doing stand up for the first time or auditioning for SNL, it would go, let me do the one where he's done it a million times. It's, you know what I mean? Like your body doesn't understand what getting to be on a t-shirt or a billboard is. Right. That's just yeah. like mental stuff that you contribute to for better and worse. Because when you do, when you fantasize us, when you have daydreams, it's just you going, it would be amazing to have this. But then the inverse is true, too, where, you know, then the gravity of that inverts. And when you don't have it, it hurts, you know, just as much. So I don't know. I've Lately, I'm just trying to because I audition for sitcoms like every fucking two days of my life. Um, so you, I kind of just try to focus on like, let me do a good job. 
is if I did a good job and I proved to myself that I can do a good job, I feel good and I feel whole and money will come and you know, that stuff comes, whatever. Dude, I I definitely think you are a uh, a rising star. I think something's gonna be popping real soon, um, and uh, and yeah, man, and congratulations again on on Wolf Pup. This is you. Just you drew up your own merch hat. That's your uh, your yeah, logo. This is, uh, it's actually my tattoo. Oh shit! Nice, <laughs> excellent, man. I gotta, I gotta get. Uh, I'm gonna get on the on the website and buy buy myself a hat. Wow, and, and give it. give you some props, but um, but yeah, man, and. Um, everybody can go and, and see you. Um, you. You're always performing all over the city, but you're getting ready to go on a tour, and you're actually going to be here on Long Island, the Governor's Brokerage. Yes, uh, on June 22nd. Yes, June 22nd. I'll be at Brokerage. Um, next weekend, I'll be in Philly, uh, April 5th and 6th. I'll be up in Jersey uh, at Crystal Springs, which is a cool place, and then. Uh, Queens Lounge, May 9th, and New Haven, Connecticut. There's Portland, Maine is up there. Uh, New Hampshire, the Music Hall, that's going to be sweet. Um, Auburn, Maine. Nice. And then uh, Austin, Texas in July. And then there'll be, a, there'll be a bunch more added in the next couple of weeks. So come check me out. If you're not already, check me out on Instagram. You know, feel free to DM me, drop me a line about whatever. Love talking to people. So, Don, thank you so much for having me, man. Thank you so much, Nick. And it's um, uh, at Mr. Nick Callis, uh, C-A-L-L-A-S. Um, so go follow him on Instagram and TikTok and all that stuff. And you'll see all of his his hilarious stuff. He, he does the sketches, stand up, everything's in there. Um, dude, thank you so much, Nick. You dude, thank rock, you. my friend. Truly. I appreciate it. I'll talk to you soon, I'm sure. Right. Take care, brother. <laughs>